Um, so we'll get started. Uh, I'm Micah May. I'm director of ebook services at the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, and I really want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us. We're really happy to be convening this conversation about how libraries and publishers can work together to create access and promote literacy. Uh, that's really a core part of DPLA's mission. Um, you probably all know this, but DPLA is a nonprofit dedicated to maxing, maximizing access. Uh, we do that by helping libraries and other cultural institutions serve their patrons more effectively. We aspire to create a single point of access and a gateway to America's cultural riches that's available to all. Uh, an open, distributed national library to educate, inform, and empower everyone. Uh, and we do this principally by helping our institutional partners, uh, libraries, and other cultural institutions. So we recognize that ebooks and audiobooks represent a important and increasingly important way that Americans access knowledge and culture. Uh, and that's why we wanted to convene this conversation uh, to help explore how that can continue to improve. So briefly, I just want to share our ebook work uh, includes a number of different elements. We do host the only library driven content marketplace, the DPLA Exchange with hundreds of thousands of ebooks and audiobooks libraries can license. We also bring together the best of the openly licensed ebooks on our open bookshelf, um, and that's available uh, to libraries to integrate into their own collections and also to the general public. Um, I'd like to thank Bree, uh, who heads our curation core and all of the members of the curation core, who we're very proud of. We have a dozen librarians that help us sort through those books. Um, and uh, and Bree Furkron is the head of that um, and is doing a wonderful job at, at create, creating that collection. Um, we also participate in helping to strengthen the Library Simplified community, which is at the very core of our effort to create a library driven channel for ebook and audiobook delivery. Uh, so we're proud to be a, a part of that and to continue to try to grow and strengthen that community. Um, we also uh, have recently begun to experiment with doing some of our own publishing to create better access to particularly important works that began with began with the Mueller report and the impeachment papers that we published last year and we're also beginning to help partners do the same so convert books into ebooks to make them more accessible and finally uh, we're proud to have a role in doing convenings like this so helping to bring our community together to make sure that we're having important discussions about uh, about how to generate access. So that convening role is something DPLA does across all of our work and we're, we're happy to be doing that also in the ebook space. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers and let you know what's to come. Um, we have, uh, the, our first speaker will be Kelvin Watson, who's gonna be in a conversation with the DPLA Executive Director, John Bracken. Um, and then that will be followed by a panel that my colleague Michelle Kimpton uh, will be uh, hosting and, and, and leading uh, with uh, Cindy Aiden, the State Librarian of Washington, Mallory Bontrager, Digital Services Manager at the Independent Publishing Group, IPG, which we're very excited to be adding to the exchange. Um, uh, and uh, then Lisa Peet will be hosting a, a conversation with Andrew Medlar, Director of Book Ops at the New York Public Library. Um, and Adam Silverman, Senior Director of Business Development at HarperCollins. Um, and then Lisa will also lead the discussion in terms of our Q&A in the last segment of this. Um, and finally, at the end, you'll hear a little bit from Jill Blades, my colleague who leads outreach for the DPLA EVO team. Um, that, first, that first group that Michelle will be uh, leading will include Cindy Mallory and Kelvin as well. Um, so I hope that's an exciting lineup for everyone. Uh, we're now going to be turning off video and audio for folks that are not actually presenting. Um, and one final sort of administrative note, if you have questions, which we really hope you do, we are looking forward to your questions and counting on them, please use the Q&A box, which you'll see the fourth icon from the left uh, in the bottom of your Zoom panel. You can put questions there throughout the panel. Um, we will respond to some of them immediately and others Lisa will bring into the discussion um, uh, at the end. Uh, so, uh, we, we will have a transcript available. I see that in chat. Um, so this is being recorded and we'll make it available. Um, so with that, I'd like to pass this to John Bracken, who will kick us off with a conversation with Kelvin. Thank you. 
Thank you, Micah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, it, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Kelvin. Um, in addition to his hat as director of Broward County, um, I, I think he's known to, if you're on this call, you probably know Kelvin, given his leadership role in the space as a director at large at PLA, past president of the Black Caucus of ALA, member of the Book Industry Study Group Board, um, I should say been a friend of mine in this role and a friend of a ALA and a guide and a mentor to so many of us in the field. And if that wasn't a reason enough, Kelvin, to ask you to kick this off with us, the piece you wrote, you wrote a piece in Library Journal uh, a couple months ago uh, that articulated, I think, in some of the questions a lot of us have been thinking through during this moment in time. Um, and I'm gonna just pull out one bullet uh, first, actually, before I do that, I know you're in South Florida, and those of us who are tracking the news want to know we're, you know, we're worried about you, we're concerned about you. Uh, I know you, I can tell. I've been on enough calls with you that I know that you're in your office, so your doors are still open. Uh, thank you for all you're doing, and I hope you, you and yours are are well and safe. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. Yeah, I'm in my office. Um, we are. Um, uh, close to the public um, in serving them other than curbside and walk-up service. But I have been in the office, except for, of course, holidays, and, and um, but every day since COVID-19 um, really became a, a, an issue here uh, for us in, in the United States. So in kicking us off, I want to cite the piece you wrote in May and you really, you, you articulated, I should say in early May, because there were other events in May that I, I want to touch on too, but you said this is a powerful moment for public libraries, an opportunity to evaluate, evaluate and require equity. Um, and you put it in the context of three components necessary for a successful library experience, access, discovery, and delivery. And I'm not in a conversation about eBooks or any other aspect of our work that doesn't touch on equity and access uh, and the urgency of it given the, the experience of the pandemic and, and the urgency pushed forward by the social movement that's taken place in the months since, since the murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Right. Um, and so I guess I want to start there and just you know, get your sense of how your grounding as you think about your day-to-day -day work has changed in terms of eBooks and and how you're just thinking differently about about um, digital conveyance of of literature and content. Well, well thanks, John. So you know, I'll I'll start by saying, um, you know, these these equity issues have been um, around for quite some time, and they just they continue to evolve. But now more than ever, we have. You know, we're, we're in a place where we are deli primarily delivering all of our services online. Um, it's critical that that um, that the, the public who uses the libraries have access to the access is really about you know the the internet and being able to um, use that resource as a um, um, you know, a utility, right? It's a necessity, and 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 it really became um, um, pertinent during this time. And nationally, people are really talking about how we can really expand and and have that broadband access. But the discovery and delivery pieces really are around what the publishers and 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 libraries and how we work together. Um, it, you know. Um, moving forward, right? We have multiple licensing um, issues. Uh, and so, you know, um, th therefore, if if something has gone away, because we only had it for 52 weeks, for example, that is no longer discoverable. So therefore, we certainly can't not deliver it. <laughs> so um, so when, when I'm talking equity, I'm talking, you know, again, all three of those and, you know, pricing, the delivery methods, you know, ease of use, not having things, you know, not having you go through 14, 15 steps to, to access that, that content. And so that's why we need to continue to work together, the libraries and publishers, so that we can offer new ways for the community to discover um, 
all of this information, educational, recreational resources. And I think, again, now these, these things really became evident when we had to shift to a uh, pr primarily an all virtual way of delivering our, our, our services. I know that you've, I've heard you speak passionately about some of the innovations you've taken on in terms of book discussions and, and, and reading clubs and um, how you've used that as a way to build inclusivity, both in terms of who, who you're convening and the type of content you're focusing on. Could you talk a little bit about the, the book discussions and, and again, maybe how you're thinking about them in this <laughs> weird, period that we're in right now? Well, that's, that's, that's uh, a perfect transitional question. So, so we started this um, director's book discussion. Um, and the, I mean, I'll tell you quickly how it started. It started because my branch managers, I felt like they weren't doing um, a good a, a job, the, the job well enough, to, you know, to own their book discussions. We had pretty much transitioned them and our fringe groups were, were leading them. And so, after I said I wanted to have our branch managers lead these discussions, one of my um, administrative staff said, well, why don't you do it? Well, why don't you do one? And so two years, two and a half years ago, I began going out into the community um, discussing books and, and I don't pick the books actually, my collection management pick, team picks the books, but the books that we primarily pick are actually focused on community issues that we're dealing with right now, for example. Like we, we, read, some, we read some material um, recently that coincided with what's happening now with Black Lives Matter and the, and the, and the, the, the community issues. Um, even though it was an, a much older book, it was a Ernest Gaines' A Lesson Before Dying. So I then go out and, and I talk about these, um, these issues with um, and in my case, the book, the, the, the people that I'm talking to at these book discussions uh, are people who primarily don't look like me. I mean, just, I'll just say it like that. So the next this book that's coming up that I'll be doing virtually, actually, um, in about three weeks, we're going to be discussing um, uh, Colson Whitehead's the, uh, the Nickel Boys, for example, which is based on um, a, a reformatory that was here in uh, Florida, and it, it, it actually is relevant today when you talk about the criminal justice system, um, you know, um, the things that are happening with, with, um, with youth and how the, you know, the, the, the prison, um, you know, the prison pipeline, you know, that people talk about as well. So we use these, we use these discussions, I use these discussions as a way to not to hum to to um, not only humanize myself with with um, with the public and the people that we serve and that they have an opportunity to speak with the director, but I also use them as a way to talk about these issues that need to be talked about and addressed. Um, and so that's what we so that's how we're doing it, John. And, it, and it's been uh, two and a half years in, very successful. And I'm doing at least two of these virtual events uh, in the, in the next few weeks. Thanks. That's good. I mean, so I guess one question, one last question to throw at you before we bring in the larger discussion, and I turn it over to Michelle. Which is, you know, I, I know a big part of a public library's role, and I know it's something you've I've heard you talk about, especially in a moment of economic crisis, is. Um, about being responsive to community and uh, thinking through things like workforce transitions and workforce development. And I wonder if how you think about your workforce goals in the context of your digital oriented work, or are they or are they separate and apart? Well, they are. They are both in. Um, they work together. Um, I was just having a conversation with some folks yesterday, and um, I was talking about how. The, the, the resources that we provide, our collections and our programs are actually um, one in the same, that we should be leveraging the collection, the materials, the books, the ebooks, the audio books, the databases, et cetera, 
along with the programming. So when I'm so when, so when I'm transitioning and I'm talking about workforce development and we're doing things with workforce development, we are combining our resources along with technology like um, um, now that you know that you know a lot of job resumes or things are done online, how do you how do you put those on tablets? So I'm working with um, you know folks using models that we used in New York um, to put resources on tablets to help people transition in um, into new jobs, especially here in, in in Florida, South Florida specifically, where we we're going to have um, a, a hit with hospitality and retail and all these people who uh, are unemployed, restaurants, etc. So I'm combining technology resources as well as the program which is the workforce development programmatic aspects all all together so they all work together in my mind well thanks for kicking us off now i'm gonna we'll, we'll bring in some other folks broaden this conversation i'll step away and hand the mic over to my colleague and friend michelle kimpton great thank you john and uh, I'm going to open up the first panel discussion with uh, two well-known enthusiasts in the space, Cindy Aiden, who's the State Librarian at Washington, and Mallory, who is from Independent Publishing Group. I'm really excited to have this conversation with the two of them. And I'll start off with Cindy. Um, Cindy, you and I have had many discussions about ebook licensing, particularly seems like in the last few months. Uh, I know that you chair, uh, I believe you chair the ebook working group for COSLA and in have a meeting with stakeholders across the country really over the last year to talk about ebook licensing. And maybe you could share with everybody here on the panel, um, everybody here today, why you're so passionate about this and you feel that this topic is important and what you've learned. Sure, yes, thank you. I do think that um, to borrow some of uh, Kelvin's ideas and statements, it really is the moment is now for libraries. And it feels to me like the two really defining issues that we've got to um, own really and work out are around broadband accessibility and eBooks, it's particularly this uh, pricing that works for authors, publishers, booksellers, and libraries better than the system is working now. So I am really passionate about this and I feel like there's really an opportunity to make some changes here and that libraries have sort of held back a little bit. The whole ebook thing was, uh, you know, kind of happened in a backwards sort of way. It wasn't an initially integrated part of library collections. It took a long time for ebooks to get off the ground from a retail standpoint. So it seems that we're now playing catch up. Great. And I know um, from our conversations that you did a national survey to patrons, um, I think based out of Washington State, but I think it went broader. Um, was there anything in that study of particular interest that really helped inform your thinking in terms of how patrons um, work with ebooks and what that really means for licensing and, and maybe different ways we should be thinking about things? You know, COSLA, which is the association that includes all the state librarians and chiefs of state library commissions around the country, has done some surveys with its members around ebooks. But I think the survey you're referring to was done in the Jefferson County Rural Library District here in Washington State under the direction of Tamara Meredith, the director there. She put out a really good survey, and I shared it with my COSLA colleagues. She shared it broadly, and we got a good cross-section of responses. And that survey pretty much, I think, under, uh, underscored what we all know as librarians, which is that uh, the questions were around what the, the survey incidentally was given to patrons, people who use eBooks in libraries. And we asked them, what happens if the eBook that you are looking for in specific is not available? And oh, 56% of the time, the reader will find another eBook. And only 30% of the time will they go to the print version of the title they were looking for. And I think 8% of the time they would end up purchasing that title that they were originally looking for. 
And then the remainder of that percentage, whatever it is, 6%, was unknown. We don't know what users uh, do. But it was really interesting because I think that uh, librarians will tell you that people who love ebooks want to read in that format. And so they'll put a hold and they'll move on, but they will find an ebook to read. Yeah, so that's really interesting information to inform, you know, they love the format and it doesn't have to be a bestseller, but people will be looking for a variety of ebooks in a particular genre um, that they might choose if one's not available. So given, um, given your work, do you have a model or a framework in mind that you think might best serve libraries, patrons, and authors, given this data that you've collected and these conversations that you've had at this point? Well, um, to, again, looking at what Kelvin has written and what he has said publicly and what all of us have been saying, you know, there are a few things that we all agree on, certainly. The big one, I would say, is do not give us time limited licenses because books ebb and flow sometimes in their popularity or they take a while to become popular and then suddenly there's a run on that title. You know, the one that I, um, I really looked into when I was preparing to talk to um, John Sargent at Macmillan was one of his titles, The, uh, the uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Everybody remembers that book. Every book group in the country has read it. it took four years after its pub date before it really enjoyed a huge surge in sales. So don't put a time limit on it. Do, do it circulation based. Libraries really want to have simultaneous use. Publishers are very threatened by that. That's part of the, um, that's part of the But there can be opportunities where a simultaneous use book really makes sense, like promoting it for a book club sort of environment. Simul or perpetual use is another thing that the two sides, I think, can come to some kind of agreement on it. But perpetual use is of great interest to the library community. It is seen as a problem in the publisher and, and, and author royalty conversations. But I do think there's a way to find a way to do that. I think at, um, managing ebooks from a librarian standpoint is very costly and time consuming. Managing the hold list, managing the costs and the replacements. So it's nice when the licenses are not short term and when you can count on some books being available for a long period of time. You know, the thing that, um, as you know, we've been exploring lately is the idea of if a print book in a library has been an acceptable model for authors, publishers, booksellers, if everyone was comfortable with the numbers around that print book, could we replicate that in an ebook model? And so that has been the most recent uh, thing that I've been working on with other colleagues. And I think that there is some possibility there. And it's not very far away from models that are already out there. And frankly, it's more favorable to libraries than some of the models. Because that model suggests that 40 circs is about the number of circs a hardbound book gets before it gets pulled off the shelf to be replaced or evaluated for wear and tear. And so if you had a 40 circ model on the price of a book, the market price of a book, that, that actually uh, could work. And it sounds like a lot of that premise is that it would model the physical book, which libraries and publishers and authors are familiar with and know what that model is, so. Right, and from a royalty standpoint, the ebook marketplace has already adjusted the author royalty. Uh, author gets a far higher royalty for an ebook sale than it does for print sales. So that when you look at the numbers, it actually is about the same amount of money per read, as the publishing world likes to call it, um, for a hardbound book or an ebook. And so, if the library model can replicate that and keep that royalty number at the same level per read, as we say, then uh, we should be in far less uh, threatening territory. Great. Okay, and Mallory, this is a perfect transition to you. That. Is that the independent publisher group? Uh, I know that DPLA is testing new models with IPG. And can you tell us a little bit about what is going to be offered and what the potential interest is in looking at these models with DPLA? 
Yeah, so we are offering three different models with DPLA. Um, we have the traditional perpetual one user, one copy model. Then um, the other two are bundles. So the second model is a bundle of 40 lens um, with uh, access up to 10 users at a time. And then the third model is bundles of five lens available simultaneously. So the perpetual is, of course, very standard, it's known to us and to our publishers. Um, but these bundles are really uh, new territory for, for IPG and for our publishers. Um, so I'm excited to see how, see how all that goes. Great, and it's been so great to work with you on these new and innovative models to try and get books, e-books into the hands of patrons. Um, so a question for you, um, what, you know, to measure success in your mind, for IPG's mind, what indicators are you looking for? Like, if you'd want to roll these models out more broadly, have you thought about that? Yeah, I think, uh, simply put, we want to hear from libraries and librarians to know what works and what doesn't. Uh, IPG has a sort of uh, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks kind of philosophy when we uh, uh, work with publishers, work with new partners, work with potentially rolling out new models, things like that. Um, we think it is in our best interest to be everywhere possible. And so if a model, we're willing to try anything at least once um, with the scope of publishers we work with, um, about 1,200 publishers around the world. Um, our digital catalog alone is over 350,000 products. Um, so I'm sure that we have something that would fit in any kind of model um, that library that would work for purchasing options then, right? Um, so we definitely want to track the success. We want to see how well it goes in the DPLA exchange. Um, but then from there, the only limitation is what our library partners, the, the suppliers uh, can offer from like an operational perspective. So, yeah. Great. Kelvin, I know you've been sitting here on the sidelines listening. How do you feel about this conversation and what would you like to, to add given your uh, vantage point? So I'll add a couple of things. I certainly, um, as Cindy mentioned, um, have been um, a, a vocal advocate of having uh, variable uh, license models offered. Um, totally think that you know, I remember back when, you know, and I'm going to use some of the publishers' names, but HarperCollins came out with the 26 checkouts, right? That actually seemed to work a lot better than all these other models that have come, you know, and I'm, I'm probably, you know, dating some of us on the call, but that, that it's been, you know, a few years since that happened. But that that's what, you know, we, we need, right? I, I'm certainly for... Uh, something like what Penguin is doing right now, right? They're, during COVID-19, they're offering licenses on audiobooks and um, on, in both perpetual and metered models, right? So we know they can be done. The options are there. Um, and if I can quote from Brian O'Leary, the executive director of BISG, who had a, uh, they had a panel earlier this week, he said something that, he said something that went like this, we need to look at the supply chain as a whole and determine what can be done to increase agility of the marketplace overall. And that is what we're talking about, right? In this time, we need to be flexible. We need to be looking across the entire industry, publishing, libraries, you know, retail, um, you know, the vendors, everybody. Um, and, and that's what needs to, uh, needs to happen. So that's my, that's my uh, couple of comments from the, from the sidelines. Excellent. Okay, well, that's gonna close the first uh, panel. We have a very uh, tight ship we have to run here, lots of great speakers. So I am going to turn it over to Lisa Peep, news editor from Library Journal. Thank you all. Thank you. I am I am happy to be here um, talking with two folks from the industry. Um, I've got um, Andrew Medler from Book Ops. He's the director of Book Ops for New York Public and Brooklyn Public Libraries, and Adam Silverman, who's the senior director of business development at HarperCollins. Um, so anyway, so I want to start off asking you, Andrew. Um, NYPL created um, the app Simply E, the e-reader app. Um, which is fantastic. I've been using it since about the second it dropped constantly. Um, 
And I know that recently you used it to create a virtual book club in partnership with Public Radio NYC. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that program and how it worked? I think you're muted, Andrew. Am I? Can you hear me now? Great, excellent, thanks. Thanks, Lisa, and hi, everybody. And I would be delighted to tell you about it. It's a virtual program, virtual uh, ebook program that NYPL has partnered with. As you said, WNYC, New York Public Radio, our local NPR station, to basically to expand our reach and expand our service. And we began this in April as like all of us were looking for, in those early stages of looking for ways to serve our neighbors in the new environment. And this specific program was the brainchild of Brian Bannon, NYPL's Merrill and James Tisch Director of Branch Libraries and Education, which is such a perfect combination of duties and a perfect fit for this program, especially. And, um, Oh yeah, and he was a past DPLA board chair too. I should get that in there. And it began with a working relationship that he had with the new president and CEO of WNYC, Goli Shlakoslami. And she, like Brian, had recently come to New York from Chicago. So this was the perfect meeting of the minds. And WNYC has an existing daily program called All of It, which is hosted by the fabulous Allison Stewart, who some of you may, like me, may remember her from her Peabody award-winning days on MTV News and also at uh, CBS. And she's had, for a while now, a monthly book club as, as part of her radio program. And it's called Get Lit with All of It. And again, that was the foundation that we wanted to build on. WNYC brought the host, they brought that program, they brought an established audience for that program. And NYPL brought, of course, the books. We brought the ability to have discussion groups on Google Meet in all of our dozens and dozens of branches. And we brought the platform, Simply E. And so really it was a good old fashioned community read done in a new way for new times. And so far we've had four titles. We started with Deacon King Kong by James McBride. Then we did My Dark Vanessa by Kate Russell, published by the phenomenal Harper Collins. Thank you for that. The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. And coming up, we will be reading, just as Kelvin and his neighbors are reading, The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Great. So, so what came out of that? What did you find out from that? And um, what do, you, do you want to do it again? What, what would your goals be? Sure. Well, yes, 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 and yes. Uh, we've had incredible response to these books. We have seen readership go up. You know, it's, we're just on our fourth book, but readership is going up by 30 to 40 percent month to month. And it's helping us, you know, it's really helping us hit during this time where 100 percent of our reading uh, offerings have been electronic. We're seeing our Simply Checkups checkouts up by 60%. So this has been a key driver of that. Seeing um, for the last full month that we have data for the Glass Hotel, we hit 12,000 people checking out that book. So those are the numbers. What we learned from all of that is that this is, we were learned, we learned and actually were reminded of the fact that publishers are willing, are willing to be our partners on community reads programs like this. And that applied in this case specifically with uh, negotiating with us on cost per use models to make sure that no one who came to Simply Eat to check out this book uh, during the month that we were focusing on those books was turned away. We learned that Simply E swim lanes, the way that we organize books on Simply E, and we learned that they're fantastic for promotion and discovery. Like I said, we're up 60% um, on Simply Checkouts, and we're seeing higher numbers of Simply Checkouts for the titles in this specific book club program than for others. So that's great. And we also learned that it's really expensive. It's really expensive. So again, we're grateful for our partnership with the publishers and Yet, circ per use costs a lot, and it's 
it's not sustainable. It's great for this program, which is, you know, a contained four weeks for a single title, and, and that's very positive, but uh, it is really expensive. Fortunately, the impact that we've been seeing in, the, in these great numbers that we're really pleased with, and will definitely be a part of, of moving forward and doing this further, uh, are really, it's helping us hit NYPL's strategic goal, which is quite simply, and in words that make a librarian's heart happy, more people reading more. So it's helping us to do that. We're going to continue this specific program. We have several months uh, ahead already planned. And in addition to, as I said, individual branches within NYPL having book discussions online about each of these titles, each month features in a grand finale on Allison's radio program, interviews with the author and musical guests, thematic musical guests that that come together as well. So that's great, we'll keep doing that. We're also building on this model um, in, in other ways and leveraging Simply E and those swim lanes to help us promote and, and expand our reach and be even more relevant and help more people read more. Ideal example of that is our Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture's new Black Liberation reading list, which is featured on Simply E in a swim lane. And we have worked with, again, with our amazing publishing partners to provide uh, as much simultaneous use as possible. So no one is turned away when they come to NYPL to read. That's fantastic. Um, so speaking of publisher partners, um, Adam, you had a title as one of the, um, as one of the book groups that was featured, um, and you got to see the effects uh, up close and personal what what was HarperCollins' interest to begin with in participating? And and are you happy with the results? Would you do it again? Yeah, I mean, um, HarperCollins has been participating in community reads uh, programs for several years now. Um, um, we started, the first one I was involved in was 2016, and we did not now around the country. Um, the structure was, um, with the New York Public Library was very interesting because uh, it was a, a new book right off the shelf um, was published, so that was a new opportunity which we really, really enjoyed. Um, but we've been really happy with, with the results so far. Um, when we look at those community read programs um, with a lot of enthusiasm, uh, both as a way to expose new books, um, but also to have readers to our more established authors. Um, okay, great. Um, and and um, what are you offering through DPLA? Well, the, uh, well, the program has two models in, in large places, standard terms. So there's the, the aforementioned 26 or 26 uh, category that is interesting to hear about the, the data on search usage. Um, I was actually a very long time ago involved in my project on the circuits and did a lot of calls to libraries to figure out. And how did that number should be to you, but I think there's something wrong with your audio. A lot of us are hearing it cut in and out. Um, I'm not you sure. sure. Uh, uh, Maybe try stopping the video for a second and see. We love to see your face, but we really want to hear what you're saying. So you're Let me stop the video and see if that works better. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that helped, but we can try. Okay, well, um, um, it's still maybe the microphone. I wonder. The microphone. Hey, there we go. That sounded better. That was better. <laughs> Um, so it's interesting to hear 
Sorry, you're having some trouble with your audio. But anyway, um, we're going to have to move over to Q&A. We've got some really good audience questions. So um, I'd like to start with one, um, one attendee. Um, he's asked, uh, his library has eBooks, or his or her, sorry. My library has eBooks by many different vendors. So the patrons have to deal with different interfaces, and they don't know what to expect when they open a title. Is there any way for libraries to make this less of an issue? for the user or reader. And um, I'd like to hear Andrew weigh in on this, please. Yes, excellent. Thank you for asking that question. Simply E is your solution for platform fatigue. It, is, it does exactly what, you, what you're suggesting. Simply E brings together titles from different sources into one platform that's an easy to use and consistent interface that the library has control over and that the library uh, can control over how, how things are displayed, the swim lanes that I mentioned before, and branding is a key part of that too. And I think another advantage is that while it, while simply does provide that access for those patrons who, who um, haven't yet seen the light about how much they're going to love it, uh, the content is still available in the uh, original, original vendor app. So, um, at, no one loses access, but this simply can take the ebook content and again, provide it in a single and consistent, easy to use interface. Cool. I would agree with you on that one. It's a terrific program. Um, and, and I actually had a question um, and I'll just put this up for grabs. Um, Mallory, you had said that you all wanted to hear um, from librarians and library partners about what works. Now, what would be the best way for people to do that? How can they let you know what's going on? Um, how can they tell you? I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> um, it's not fancy, but just reach out via email <laughs> and I would love to hear from libraries. I have community we communicate then with our publishers. I think one of the biggest um, hurdles that we face is putting publishers directly in contact with libraries because there are so many publishers and so many libraries and what works at one library doesn't work for another, very obviously so. Um, and likewise, the publishers, right? So with our um, volume of publishers and content, um, it is a little tricky to get that direct correspondence. Um, but that's something that we're internally at IPG looking into and like ways we can create that bridge. Um, because you know, the publisher comes to us, we go to our library supplier, our library partners, who then send the content to you guys uh, as librarians. Um, and so there are just a lot of, a lot of different moving pieces that have to be in place. And if we can create a bridge from publisher to library, we want to be helpful in that space. Um, so you can email me <laughs> if you have feedback on any content from, or any feedback on the content from IPG, any licensing models that you'd like to try. Um, I'd love to hear it, so. Okay, great. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on that one? I'd love to just ask Mallory, Mallory more about that too, because is um, you you represent a great group because you represent a lot of independent publishers. So 
there's an awesome opportunity to get at a whole bunch of different diverse content with one um, conduit, if you will, speaking to you. One of the things that I think libraries haven't really had the chance to do is work directly with publishers. It's not really practical to work with a million different libraries. And we've had some traditional go-betweens. Our vendors, our, our Ingrams and Baker and Taylors have always been there sort of working it uh, for libraries. But now it feels like there's an opportunity and a need for libraries to engage a little bit more. And this is what I love, of course, about Simply E, because it feels more like a library-driven product and the DPLA marketplace is like a sandbox where you can play with different licensing models. Do you, I mean, I know you're just one representative of one publisher and maybe Adam can say something, but do you think truly that um, there's an opportunity for libraries to talk more directly with publishers and that that might help the kind of tensions that have come up? Yeah, I think, um... That's, I think there's a real possibility. It might just take a bit to get there because we're starting with so many hurdles in the way, right? Um, so we have frequent newsletters and things like that to our publishers. I will speak on behalf of our publishers. Um, they are very willing to, they want the engagement. They trust libraries to hand sell their content um, and love supporting libraries as a result of that. You know, they want to be in all these different places um, because we know the value of libraries and librarians. Um, and so I think they're, they are very much ready to have direct relationships, conversations, whatever. Um, it's just a matter of how do we do that in a way that isn't a ton of work for everyone. <laughs> Um, which is the which is the challenge, um, but yeah, I think there's. Thank you. Yeah. And on that point, Mally, that's something I would bring up is that we've heard from other publishers is that working with all these libraries would be overwhelming, and so how do you effectively get those library publisher conversations to really find the collaborative pathway for both when they're, you know, they prefer, sometimes publishers prefer to deal with aggregators, intermediaries, um, but then you don't necessarily hear the voices. So I'm curious, Adam or Mallory, comment on that. Before, I mean, HarperCollins has a very active library marketing department, Virginia Stanley and her team, um, I know, um, uh, you know, are, are very active with, with libraries directly. So, um, we look to them for guidance. We don't make a distinction in format um, between print or e or audiobook. So um, Virginia Stanley and her group, um, you know, go to all the conferences. They talk to libraries regularly. They set up uh, a lot of the author engagement, and they communicate with us regularly. If there are more business conversations, uh, they usually get directed towards myself. Um, so. My understanding is that the relationship in terms of communication with HarperCollins is fairly robust. Um, I know there's concerns around business models, um, and that usually will come to me. Um, and we try to have those conversations as often as possible. Um, and I'd love for people to contact me um, when they would want to. I'd, I'd welcome that. Um, I do some regular calls, but to a small pool. Um, I don't come from a library background, so. Um, you know, my Rolodex is, is somewhat limited, and I um, often look to Virginia and her group to set up calls. Um, but we certainly welcome uh, as much conversation as possible. On the business side, it's simply easier um, and also much more practical to work through third-party aggregators for actual fulfillment. You know, HarperCollins just doesn't have the infrastructure um, to work directly with, with 9,000 libraries, if, you know, or individual libraries. But in terms of the relationship um, on, on a sort of understanding how the publisher works and having the publisher understand what libraries need, um, I think those conversations should happen directly. Okay, great. Listen, um, I'm just going to backpedal for one second. Um, Adam, since we can hear you now um, much better than before, I was just wondering if there are any of your key points that you had been going over earlier that we couldn't quite catch that you want to just include right now at the very end because we're about to wind up. Sure, sure. Um, and I apologize for, for the problem. I'm glad everyone can hear me now. Um, I think maybe the thing that I was talking about initially that um, is worth repeating is just HarperCollins' interest in working with libraries on these community reads programs. 
And so while we offer um, almost the entire backlist uh, through our pay-per-use model, and we also do front list, um, we also do negotiate fixed fee arrangements for community reads. So libraries that are worried about managing budgets with just kind of making something available through the pay-per-use catalog, while we understand that that's a challenge, um, there is the fixed fee um, structure we have uh, worked with as well. Uh, the downside for that, as I, as I said before, is just when we work with pay-per-use, libraries get to pay uh, direct 100% of their budget to actual usage. So you only pay for what's checked out. When you work on a, on a sort of fixed fee, it's based on sort of anticipated usage. And so it's not as efficient. So our hope was that the pay per use model would be more attractive for libraries because it allows you to allocate perfect use of your limited resources. Okay, um, but of course, any feedback on that would be, would be welcome to hear because again, that's us kind of looking at it from our perspective um, and what we anticipate demand and usage and concerns of libraries to be. Great, Adam, thank you so much. And thank you for the recap. And sure. we are just about out of time. Um, so I would like to hand this over to Jill. Thank you all so much for being here. I learned a lot. Um, I hope everybody did. Um, this is terrific. So, so Jill, you wanna take it away? Yes, thanks Lisa. We just want to thank you all very, very much again for joining us today for this conversation. It's an important conversation right now. Um, I, Kelvin, I really uh, was fascinated by your mention of Ryan O'Leary's point about looking at the supply chain as a whole in order to increase agility within the market. And I, I do think DPLA, that is uh, what drives our, our work through the DPLA exchange. And the DPLA Exchange really, truly right now is the only library driven purchasing platform for ebook and audiobook material for libraries. Um, our size and our, uh, you know, nonprofit background really does help us work um, to be agile for libraries uh, and we're adding services and books every day uh, to make that happen. Um, I did want to mention an up, well, as we look at what um, investing in ebooks through DPLA could do. I want to look at something else we're doing on the other side of our organization, Cultural Heritage Organization. Next week uh, on the 16th, there will be another webinar. We're going to put a link for registration in the chat here. It's for the Black Women's Suffrage Collection in honor of Ida B. Wells's birthday next week. And that, that chat will be there. But we're really happy to be able to work together on both sides to make things happen uh, constantly. We're moving very quickly. So um, if you have any questions about ebooks through DPLA, my email is jill at dp.la and we'll send out a note. We've recorded this and we're just, again, so grateful to our panelists and so grateful to every person who, who dialed in today. Thank you very much.